Hi, I'm Elijah Notable, and today I'm going to talk to you about getting your data into ChatGPT. The number one thing that I hear when people are asking about ChatGPT is, and it's whether or not they're using the Notable plugin, how do I get my data into ChatGPT? So today we're going to talk about seven different ways you can get your data into ChatGPT, whether it's Excel, it's a database, it's CSV, or raw text, or JSON. In past videos, I've shown you how to get to data by pointing to the URL of the data set. Today, we're going to talk about using the Notable Notebook to load your data into that notebook and then access it through ChatGPT. First off, we're going to look at Excel data. I'm going to open up a folder where I've got an Excel spreadsheet. I'm going to drag that Excel spreadsheet into my Notable Notebook project. And you'll see it pop up there, rural atlas data 24.xlsx. And then I'm going to go into ChatGPT. I'm going to make sure that I've got the Notable plugin installed. And then tell it to use the notebook I'm in. You don't have to specify a notebook for Notable to work. It can create a new notebook. Or if you've already got a notebook created, you can point it directly at that notebook. I'm going to tell it to load this data, rural atlas data 24.xlsx. And I'm going to ask it for charts and analysis of one of the tabs in the data. So it's going to load that data up using pandas to import the Excel file. It's going to specify the sheet name. And it's going to show me the first five rows of that data set so it can better understand what the data looks like. After that, it'll access the people tab. It'll come back to you and tell you how many columns and rows are in that data. It'll give you some understanding of what the columns are representing. And then it'll jump right to making charts from that data. Now, I can go into the Excel spreadsheet and look at the column names and specify which columns I want it to look at. I could have just told it to uh, give me an overview of the entire data set. But in this case, I'm going to pick out three columns. Net migration, 2020 to 2021 population change rate 2020 to 2021, and the percent of people under 18. And it'll start doing some analysis of that data and sure enough, come back with these distributions of population change rate under 18% and the columns that I've specified. And that's as easy as it gets to load your Excel data into ChatGPT using Notable Notebook. Now, a lot of folks are using CSV data. It's just as easy to load CSV data in as any other kind of data set. I do the same thing where I've uploaded bloodpressure.csv into my project. I tell ChatGPT that the data is stored locally. Sometimes it gets it, and sometimes you have to specify that. And I just give it the name of the data set, loads it right up pulls the first five rows to get an understanding of what the data represents. And what I love about this is based on the name of the CSV and based on those column names, even though the column just says BP underscore before, it understands that that column is blood pressure before treatment and BP after is blood pressure after treatment and age GRP means age group of the patient and so on. It does some descriptive statistics of the data telling me how many records are in the data set, how many different categories there are in the sex category and the age group category, and the most frequent uh, values in those columns. Then it builds another distribution, a different kind of data visualization for the distribution than it did before, drops that in my notebook, shows me box plots, by the before and after treatment, assuming that that's the kind of uh, information that I'm trying to understand there. Then it splits it out by age group. And it gives me some explanation in ChatGPT of what it's found. So I tell it explicitly, hey, include the learnings as a cell in the notebook, because I love having this dynamic document afterward that I can work with after I'm done with my ChatGPT session. So it's good to include that information directly into the notebook. And there we have it, a fully interactive data-driven document, all from a few simple prompts. Now, sometimes our data isn't structured. We want to load things like raw text files. 
So I, so I download an entire raw text representation of Hamlet. Again, I upload it into the project. I tell ChatGPT the notebook I want to work with. I tell it a little description of what this data is in case it can't figure it out. And I say, load this raw text and do some NLP on it, natural language processing. At first it tells me, hey, the NLTK toolkit isn't installed. So I can't do NLP on this without this toolkit installed. And it tells me how to install it. But instead of me entering that code, I just tell ChatGPT, install it and continue with the analysis. And sure enough, it installs NLTK and it does some analysis of the uh, word frequencies, named entity recognition and sentiment analysis. And at the end of it, I say, please show me some charts of the results because I want to see data visualization. I'm a data visualization guy and that's something that appeals to me. And the funny thing is, is that ChatGPT comes back and says, well, data visualization doesn't really work in some of these cases and explains that to me and explains why, which I think is an exciting feature of using ChatGPT for your data work because it's not always about getting the answer. It's about getting educated along the way. But it still does a sentiment score uh, bar chart showing the distribution of sentiment score, whether it's negative, positive, neutral, or a combination of sentiments. And that's how you load raw text into ChatGPT using Notable Notebook. The next one I'm going for is a JSON file. JSON is a nested data format that's popular for storing data. And it can sometimes be very hard to parse because there can be a lot of nested data in there. So I've loaded this JSON file into the project and pointed ChatGPT at it. I said, give me an analysis so, and chart the data so that I can understand it better. It gets to work. Comes back and you should be used to this by now with the first few rows of the data so it can better understand it. I can go over to the notebook and look at data like this instead of in that raw table view using Notable's built-in data table viewer, which is a bit more interactive and, and easier to use. And then it says, well, what kind of analysis do you want me to do? And in this case, I don't specify columns or specify a kind of analysis. I just tell it literally, go to town. And it digs into the data and it starts charting out the number of contests per year because this seems to be a data set about contests. It plots the number of contests per month. So it gets a better understanding of the distribution of the data. And then it runs into a bit of an issue. It says, it seems there was an error trying to extract the nested JSON data from one of these columns. And the error indicates that it's not in the format that is expected. And the great thing about ChatGPT using the Notable plugin is it doesn't just stop there. It starts to work on that to better understand that data. And it works through it, parses that data, even though it comes back a few times and says that it's not quite what is expected. And then it shows you this nested data structure within the JSON so that you can understand the nested structures within your nested JSON. And then it plots those. And now I've got a notebook that has that code in it, that has the analysis and the, the uh, necessary process for digging into nested JSON structure so I can either continue to work with ChatGPT or I can jump into that notebook. And now that I understand how that code is written, I can change some of the variables so that it points at the parts of the data that I want it to work on. And that's it for loading JSON data into uh, ChatGPT using a notable notebook. But it wouldn't be enough if we only dealt with static files. That's great for doing some analysis but really when we're working with data, we're gonna work with databases. So how do we connect ChatGPT to a database like a Postgres database? And the answer is you go into your notable notebook, which already has data source support, and you add your Postgres database using the data connections tab. Once I create a new data connection. I select the kind of data source that I wanna work with. And you'll notice we support a number of different data sources, Amazon Athena, CockroachDB, MySQL, Redshift, along with Postgres and, and a few more. In this case, I'm gonna say I want a Postgres database. I give it the connection details. 
I'm not going to show you the username and password and port, but I have put, had to put those into that. And once the connection is made, it's going to say, hey, we have to restart your kernel. Your kernel is what's doing all your computation under the hood. And so once you have a new data connection, that kernel has to restart to be aware of it. So we just tell it, sure, restart it. And then once I've made that data connection, I want to tell it to refresh the schema so that it can connect to that database. It can understand the schema and the tables that are in that database. And once that's done, it'll say schema refresh successful, and I can jump into my chat GPT interface and tell it again, I want to use this notebook. And I tell it, I want to look at the table in a particular database in this schema. So I don't have to tell it the particular database or the particular table. I could just let it look at the schema and work with it interactively. But in this case, I know which database I want to look at, lake underscore summit. And I want it to talk, to tell me about the tables that are in that database and then go through and do analysis and charts on that. It comes back and tells me there's two tables in there, gives me details on what those two tables have within them. So the weather table has 19 different columns in it, talking about wind direction, humidity, yearly rain, and so on. Does the same thing for the water level table, which only has two columns in it. And once it understands that data structure, it can proceed with the analysis. First thing it does is plot the water level over time. We can see that there's some interesting patterns in how that water level is being uh, stored in the database. Maybe those are some data issues or maybe they reflect periods of drought. We can go and explore that in more detail. It begins to analyze the weather table and it takes a little time for it to access the data so it lets you know hey we're still running this cell we're still running this cell and eventually it comes back and says here's what's in that table and then it does an analysis of that table too and it asks you do you want me to go on is there anything specific that you want me to look at in this postgres database and since i don't i just want to go and take a look at this great notebook that i have that has it connected to this database and you can see as you're scrolling through the notebook, again, the code that it's used to access the data, you can see how it's plotting that data. You can see the way that it uses not just Python cells, but SQL cells to select from the database uh, table. And that gives you that power then to go and write your own SQL queries or write your own code or just adjust it a little bit to get at the data you want and analyze it in the way that you need to analyze it. So let's say you want to work in the modern data stack and you've got a lot of data in a Snowflake data source. We can support that too. You can connect to Snowflake from your notebook, just like we did with the Postgres connection. We put in the name and the account details and so on. And again, I'm not going to show you the password or the account details. And we're going to connect to a Snowflake sample data set. Just like I did with the Postgres database, I restart the kernel and refresh the schema. And once that schema is refreshed, I can jump into ChatGPT. And querying Snowflake is as easy as querying a CSV or an Excel spreadsheet or a Postgres database. I just tell it, use this notebook and examine the Snowflake database schema, tpch underscore SF10. Give me charts and analysis. This time it comes back and it lets me know that you're connected to several data sources. It's got that Postgres connection and that Snowflake data connection. And also we can use querying to query CSVs and data frames if you want to using uh, DuckDB SQL. It gets into the schema I've asked it for. It lets me know that it's got columns like customer and nation and orders and so on. And then it gets the structure of those. The code that it tries initially doesn't work, so it lets you know, hey, it didn't seem to work quite right, so I'm gonna try a different approach to access that, that scheme and those tables. That second approach works, comes back, and it lets you know what's in the customer table in this schema, lets me know what's in the line item table in this schema, and I tell it, hey, stop generating, you don't have to keep going. I just wanna look at the customer table. So jump into the customer table, and give me an analysis of that table because I don't want it to go through all of the tables in the schema. That's not necessary for what I'm trying to demonstrate today. Loads the data in the customer table, plots that data, explains what's going on in there, 
plots the data in another way to try to show you some uh, distribution that's interesting. And as with every one of these data connections that I've been demonstrating at the end of it, you don't just have that answer in the ChatGPT window. You have this entire dynamic document, a computational notebook that has all your code, it has your text, it has those charts, and you can go back to it and you could schedule this as a job, you could comment on it, share it with your stakeholders, share it with your collaborators, and build your data analysis and data science collaboratively within a dynamic document instead of just leaving with a static answer. For our last example, I'm gonna show how to connect to a BigQuery database. As I've done with the Postgres database and the Snowflake data, you create a new data connection. This time it's a BigQuery connection. You give it the name and the credentials and so on. You create it, you, re you restart your kernel so that it registers it within the kernel. You refresh the schema. And once you've refreshed the schema back into ChatGPT, we tell it to use a particular notebook. We tell it to uh, query a particular data set and give me some data analysis of what's in that data set. And you'll notice in this case, I actually said to limit the columns to particular um, columns that I specify, that they have non-null results and only show me 20,000 rows. So you can include all of that in your description in ChatGPT. The prompts that you build doesn't have to be the simple prompts that I've shown today. They can be deeply inflected by your domain knowledge about the data. Comes back, it gives me a chart of service requests by neighborhood. I can say to it that uh, this is rather busy. Can you just show me the most popular service request? It does that easily. And along the way, it explains to you exactly what it's doing and it's updating the visualizations. And again, at the end of this, I don't just have those static images and static text in ChatGPT's window. Instead, I have this dynamic data-driven document that I can go and extend and I can share with folks, I can publish certain parts of it and use all of this collaborative rich functionality that's within a notable notebook. So I hope you found that valuable. Now, if you wanna connect your data to ChatGPT, I think I've given you a few different ways that you could do that. And if you stayed till the end and you've wondered, hey, where's Google Sheets and all this? Take a look at our other video where we talk about moving from a spreadsheet to a data-driven document. That connects directly to Google Sheets and does a similar sort of process to allow you to connect to Google Sheets and use the same chat GPT interface and the same kinds of prompts to get at your data.